Monsieur le Premier ministre, quel énorme plaisir d'être ici euh, avec vous ce soir euh, à cette institution magnifique et importante. You know that when you uh, first invited me to attend tonight, uh, I knew I would have to speak after you, and I almost said no because of it. <laughs> Had I known I'd have to speak after you and Frank, uh, I, would have, uh, I would have definitely desisted uh, because it is uh, always an extraordinary pleasure to be able to hear you. Um, a little more embarrassing when you're speaking about me in such glowing terms, but uh, I, uh, I uh, very, very much appreciate it. Uh, je suis tellement heureux d'être ici ce soir avec vous, avec uh, Mila et avec uh, tant de vos amis. Uh, J'ai été uh, très honoré de pouvoir visiter uh, le, la Hall uh, Brian Mulvoney. Um, the reality is he got to bring me into the replica of the center block office, and the fact that uh, I am now banished to the Mackenzie Tower in the West Block uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, as for the past three years and for the next ten or so, the uh, center block of Parliament is going to be under renovations. Uh, it was nice to spend a few moments in my old office as well as yours. <laughs> Merci pour cette introduction. Uh, C'est uh, extrêmement généreux de votre part de m'avoir uh, uh, inclus ici ce soir. Uh, et, euh, et d'avoir dit des choses euh, positives au niveau de, de tout ce qu'on est en train de, de livrer et de faire ensemble pour euh, les provinces de l'Atlantique et, et pour tous les Canadiens. Euh, je continue d'être ici pour, pour vous, pour cette institution et pour tout le monde qui habite dans les provinces de l'Atlantique. Um, again, uh, it's a pleasure also to be here with uh, so many other friends. Uh, Premier Houston, thank you uh, for welcoming us here uh, to your province. Uh, Sean, uh, great to have you here at your uh, alma mater. Uh, Minister uh, Petipah Taylor, Minister for ACOA, uh, as well as uh, Minister for Official Languages. Uh, it's wonderful to hear, be here with you as well, uh, as long with uh, so many members of, uh, of Parliament, uh, past and present, uh, and people committed uh, to service in communities uh, across, uh, across the country in so many ways. It is uh, a real pleasure uh, to be here with you all tonight. Before I begin, however, I do want to offer my condolences to the community of Dauphin, Manitoba. Fifteen people died as a result of Thursday's bus crash with many others in hospital. We're feeling for family, friends, neighbors, and all the loved ones of the victims. I know that the people of Canada, from coast to coast to coast, are keeping them all in their thoughts as we pray for recovery for those in hospital uh, and uh, solace for those bitterly mourning the loss of loved ones. Dauphin is a small community, like Anaganish. Communities like this are strong and resilient. And it's the people who make them so. And when we support people and we believe in them, People can be there for their communities. That's what you did, sir, four decades ago, when your government created the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. It was an act of faith in the economic future of Atlantic Canada, an act that recognized the untapped potential of Atlantic Canadians. Thank you for that on behalf of all Canadians, that Atlantic Canadians have so contributed. But he was very good at seeing potential, because he saw the potential of all of Canada when he signed first the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and then negotiated and signed NAFTA. Brian, you and I are now small members of a very small club that knows what a juggernaut negotiating NAFTA actually is. Although I would say, as you pointed out, uh, You've had that experience twice now, as you were incredibly helpful to me and to all of Team Canada uh, as uh, we were uh, renegotiating uh, the deal over the past few years. Um, this trade deal has delivered extraordinary growth and millions of jobs, but we can never take it for granted. There will be a mandatory review of it in 2026, and with the presidential election, between now and then, we're going to have to stay on top of things. So, Brian, 
Stay healthy, because we're going to need all hands on deck in 2026, just like last time, no matter who the president is. Because we can never stop making sure that we're getting the best possible deal for Canadians and for the future in everything we do. Today, we're here to look at how we can unlock economic growth for the next four decades and beyond. And let's be honest, as Brian pointed out, this is a very consequential moment we find ourselves in. To put it in terms people around here know well, we need to look at the future horizon with clear eyes and set our sails accordingly. The impacts of climate change are becoming more and more costly, even as people are still struggling with inflation and looking to leaders in government and in business to make sure that the benefits of economic growth are being shared fairly. Putin's brutal and unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine continues to impact global food and energy prices. I was in Ukraine just last week and I addressed their national legislature where I reminded them uh, that it was Canada's government in the early 90s when you were in office that was the very first to recognize Ukraine's independence as they continue to fight now for their democracy and independence, and that we as Canadians, all governments together, will continue to stand with Ukraine with whatever it takes for as long as it takes because of the right thing to do. In this moment, it is critical that we all recognize that economic policy is security policy, is climate policy, is social policy. Everything is connected. We need to meet this moment and make sure that our economy is positioned to thrive in this future. Here's the great news. Atlantic Canada has all the right ingredients to succeed. Many of you will recall that it was in Stephen Neville, Newfoundland and Labrador that our government signed the Canada-Germany Hydrogen Alliance last year. This deal will see Canadian companies exporting clean, renewable hydrogen to Germany as soon as 2025, creating great middle-class jobs and strong economies everywhere in this region. Pour exporter de l'énergie propre, Il faut aussi produire et transmettre de l'électricité propre ici, chez nous. En Nouvelle-Écosse, vous avez l'expertise et les ressources. Et vous avez des vents qui soufflent tout le temps et des marées, marées pendant, par, parmi les plus fortes de la planète. L'été dernier, j'étais ici pour annoncer un investissement dans une série d'éoliennes et dans les batteries pour stocker l'électricité propre qu'elles produisent assez pour alimenter des centaines de milliers de foyers en électricité abordable. L'île du Prince-Édouard est presque entièrement alimentée avec de l'énergie renouvelable. C'est une province qui est un leader dans le domaine de l'énergie éolienne. L'énergie renouvelable est importante pas seulement pour préserver la qualité de l'air, mais aussi pour réduire les, facteurs, les factures d'énergie des familles. Currently in Canada, almost 84% of our electricity is already generated from non-emitting sources. But we have to get to 100% by 2035, both for future generations and for great jobs right now. And of course, it is that last 16% that will be challenging and will require us all to work together. We need to get off coal to eliminate its harmful emissions, and I, I don't have to tell you why. The East Coast has been profoundly affected by the impacts of climate change. Last year, Hurricane Fiona devastated communities in all provinces, and this June's forest fires have been terrifying and costly. Just a few hours ago, I had the opportunity to see firsthand some of the impacts uh, down in Hammond Plains chat with first responders, community members who'd lost their homes, lost their pets, and were heartbroken 
and devastated. But the one thing I was hearing from those first responders, even as I was thanking them for their heroism and their incredible dedication, was concerns about next time, being prepared for the future having the right equipment, having the right communications protocols, making sure that people are better ready to respond. Because yes, this has been some of the worst forest fires in history, but people know that extreme weather events are going to continue to happen with increasing frequency. And we all need to both step up and be prepared for them, even as we minimize the impacts they'll be having decades from now on our kids and grandkids right across the country. I know that all of you in this room, as business people, also understand the solid case for clean power. In this day and age, a clean grid is absolutely essential for drawing in major investments. As the global marketplace races towards net zero, investors are flocking to regions where the energy that is de de generated and transmitted doesn't pollute. We saw it with Volkswagen's historic decision to build their first ever overseas EV battery plant here in Canada, in St. Thomas, Ontario. The company looked carefully right across North America, and one of the reasons they came to Canada was because in their mission to build clean cars, they're making sure their manufacturing uses clean electricity. We want to see investment like this coming to Atlantic Canada, too. And that's what our commitment to building the Atlantic Loop is all about. Just think of it. The East Coast could and should be a clean energy powerhouse, and this federal government will be there to help make it happen. Because not only is it the fastest and most cost-efficient way to get off coal, It'll also make sure that the Atlantic region has power to meet growing electricity demands. In this year's budget, the federal government announced a 15% refundable tax credit for clean electricity generation, storage, and transmission projects between provinces. We're also making major clean electricity investments through the Canada Infrastructure Bank, including science-based offshore wind projects here on the East Coast, in addition to funding for the Atlantic Loop. And let's be clear, getting off coal is not just climate policy, it's economic policy. I know all of you here have looked at what's happening in the US and in Europe and understand this economic imperative. We have a plan to grow a competitive economy with great jobs here and right across the country. It uses powerful tax incentives targeted investments, and a predictable price on pollution that returns money to families. Indeed, people here will be getting their first rebates starting in just a few weeks. By setting this economic policy framework, we're attracting investments and driving clean innovation that makes us competitive in the global race for clean solutions. It's important that we work together, including with the provinces and territories, to make sure Atlantic Canada has every competitive advantage possible. That's what I've continually talked with all four premiers about, so that we can give companies in the region a leg up and make sure that there are great jobs here, not just today, but for decades to come. We've got a great example of what investing in the clean economy can mean for workers right here in Nova Scotia. In March, I visited the Michelin plant over in Bridgewater. Plants like this are the lifeblood of small communities. We've all seen the hurt that follows if they close. <coughs> so keeping them is about supporting these communities and the workers who are at the heart of it all. Well, for three generations, Canadian workers at Bridgewater have made it one of the top performing Michelin facilities in the world. Workers like Jason, who was a repairman that I met there, and Natalia, who got a job at the plant after coming to Canada from Ukraine about a decade ago. Our investment will not only reduce emissions at the plant, but also modernize operations so they can help meet the global demand for EV tires. 
workers and the surrounding community rely on the factory remaining strong. Conversations I had with workers about their pride uh, in working for that plant, but also the uncertainty of coming years. And I, I got an earful of them about why EV tires are different than regular tires. It's a big deal. First of all, the torque is likely to strip off the uh, outside of tires if they're not properly built. The noise is a thing too. I, got, I, I, I geeked out on this one. Because the engine's so silent, you hear the noise of the tires much more and they have to make quieter tires for it. It's also a lot more weight on an electric vehicle than, uh, than, uh, than on regular cars because of the batteries. So uh, there's a whole level of technologies going in there, but it's important for Michelin as well that it can continue to invest in a clean grid as it moves forward to draw and be competitive on the work marketplace. Well, because of our investments, Jason and his co-workers and the 9,000 person strong community of Bridgewater can count on good, stable jobs for the next generation. Natalia actually came to Ottawa in March and was in the House of Commons when President Biden visited, which is just another way your communities and your voices resonate in Ottawa. One of the things we always need to remember is that economic growth isn't just about a big number on a bottom line. It's about creating opportunities for people and giving them a future to believe in, to invest in. So they, in turn, continue to invest in and build their communities. Prenons l'exemple de l'engagement de notre gouvernement en matière de services abordables, d'apprentissage et de garde de jeunes enfants. On a lancé ce programme il y a deux ans, et une province de la région, bravo Terre-Neuve et Labrador, a déjà atteint la cible de 10 dollars par jour. Et je sais que les autres ont déjà réussi à réduire les frais de moitié. Grâce à cette initiative, non seulement les familles économisent beaucoup d'argent, mais la participation des femmes au marché du travail a atteint un sommet sans précédent au Canada. Autrement dit, il y a plus de travailleurs, plus d'argent pour les familles et plus d'opportunités pour tout le monde. On fait aussi des investissements majeurs dans les soins de santé publique, notamment dans les soins de première ligne. Peu importe où vous habitez ou quel salaire vous gagnez, Tous les Canadiens méritent de recevoir des soins de santé de qualité. Et on met en plus en place un programme pour des soins dentaires ou une plan national. La prestation dentaire canadienne a déjà aidé plus de 300 000 enfants à améliorer leur santé dentaire. Et ces programmes, comme les soins de santé, les soins dentaires et les services de garde d'enfants, créent la stabilité sociale qui favorise la croissance de nos économies. And let's be very clear, those three initiatives that we put forward, $10 a day childcare, close to $200 billion of investment to deliver metrics and real results through healthcare investments, and dental care program that has already meant that 300,000 kids across this country have access dental care when they didn't before, are not just social programs. They are economic programs that keep us competitive. I talk a lot with international investors, and they tell, tell me regularly that in Canada, our greatest competitive advantage is not our critical minerals, not our two official languages, not our access to the coasts, not our tremendous natural resources, although those are all great, Canada's greatest competitive advantage is Canadians themselves. We are one of the best educated countries in the planet. We have a strong social safety net. We have healthy, forward-thinking, ambitious Canadians, strong in their communities, optimistic about the future. And that is something that companies around the world want to be part of in this time of tremendous uncertainty. Our strong middle class is the reason the companies from around the world want to come and build and grow here. And this is a self-reinforcing policy, because not only does it attract investments that further strengthen the middle class, 
It also helps Canada attract global talent and immigrants from around the world that again gives those same investors confidence in our potential. Canada is now the fastest growing country in the G7. Number one in terms of population growth and number two only to the US in terms of economic growth. And already we've had higher than expected GDP growth in the first quarter. Strong population growth is helping fuel economic growth and Atlantic Canada is proof of that. Halifax, Charlottetown and Moncton led the country in population growth in 2022. And since 2015, Atlantic Canada's overall population has grown by over 160,000 people, 15,000 of whom are immigrants. The programs and services Canada is providing is also helping newcomers thrive here and contribute to the Atlantic Canadian economy. We've seen incredible renewal in this region over the decades since ACOA was created. This is the legacy of Prime Minister Mulroney and Dr. Donald Savoy, and we can all be grateful for what their vision accomplished. Brian, as we were standing earlier in that replica office, I delivered to you the original report that established ACOA, dusted off and fetched from the archives of Canada to have a permanent home here at Mulroney Hall, where it deserves to be. But on the first page of that report, in the cover letter that Dr. Savoy wrote, he declared that you had put together the most comprehensive plan to promote economic development in Atlantic Canada that we had ever seen. And I'll tell you, 40 years later, that still holds true. Thank you, Brian, for everything you did then and now for Atlantic Canada. Great, now Jeanette's going to ask me for more money for ACOA, but that's okay. <laughs> it's money well spent. In 2016, our government launched the Atlantic Growth Strategy to further revitalize the region. And today we see the successes of those initiatives as the East Coast has become a place with great colleges and universities like St. FX that are doing leading research, a place teeming with startups and entrepreneurs, a place that is attracting talent from all over the world, a place that is more diverse and full of opportunity than ever. One of the great Canadian stories of the past eight years comes from right here in Anaganish. The story of a Syrian refugee, <laughs> yes, a lot of you know exactly where I'm going with this, who came to Canada after his family's chocolate factory was bombed. Tarek Haddad arrived in 2016 and with his expertise founded a new chocolate company called Peace by Chocolate. They got support from ACOA and have now created many, many jobs right here in this town. This is not just the story of Tarek or of Anna Ganesh. This is the story of Canada, a country that is welcoming, a country that invests in people, a country that not only sees the future, but seizes it, a country where everyone has a real and fair chance at success, a country that is rooted in community. Throughout our history, Canadian political leadership has never lost sight of that. And today, that's more important than ever. On a des défis énormes devant nous, le climat, la guerre, les chaînes d'approvisionnement, l'inflation mondiale, on doit adopter une approche réaliste pour relever ces défis et on doit mettre les gens au centre de nos actions. We need to meet the challenges of today with strength and optimism. We need to be fiscally responsible, yes, but at the same time we need to be unrelentingly ambitious to seize every opportunity we can for our workers and our economy. You know, Brian, there seem to be two kinds of politicians today. Those who want to burn things down and those more like you were, constantly want to build things up. Well, our government 
is and always will be focused on how we can invest in people and in the future of their communities. And that's what we'll continue to do every day to help the Atlantic Canadian economy keep growing, ensure that every region of the country prospers, and help build an economy that works for all Canadians. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis.